Didn't think I'd be saying this with the way this Premier League season has gone for Chelsea, but thank fuck the international break is finally over. Honestly, lads, one more game of fucking watching Alan Brown and Jeff Hendrick play in the middle of the park and I would have wanted to gouge my own fucking eyes out. Thank God we've only got a couple more games before the end of the year because I am sick to death of this fucking Ireland team. Troy Parrott, how have you missed that? And then we look in control against Armenia and... Fucking Armenia, by the way, and bottle it. So we still won, but we fucking bottled what should have been an easy win. Anyway, welcome back to the verdict, lads. Hello guys, how are you getting on? My name's Aaron Kelly, you're very welcome back to another episode of the Premier League Verdict, I hope you guys are doing well. The Verdict finally back after what was a, a painful international break to have to endure, but we are finally back with some club football for you lot. Now before we get into anything, if you haven't already, please do subscribe, it, it only takes two seconds, if you want to enjoy that is, and you would like to see more from the channel. And you can always change your mind later, do you know what I mean, so... Just do it. It's been so long since a verdict episode that I think I feel like I have to explain the rules here again. We have our graphic up in front of us once again, the green box being for the performance of the week. This can go to any player, team, moment, anything like that. Yellow box is for the shocking moment of the week. This can be, again, positive or negative. Stinker of the week, though, is... is very negative. You don't want to be in the red box, uh, ever. Unfortunately, my club Chelsea have been in there a couple of times this season, and it has not been fun to have to endure. But we are going to start off with our green box, and it can only go to two men. Could give it to the whole team, to be fair. But uh, I do think Erling Haaland and Phil Foden deserve their spotlight, as they completely and utterly destroyed Manchester United in Manchester City's 6-3 win in the Manchester Derby. Another embarrassing day at the office in the Manchester Derby for Manchester. Manchester United. I say that, but I was only saying during the game, Manchester United actually have a really respectable record at the Etihad over the last couple of years, certainly recently. I remember Ole Gunnar Solskjaer actually had an, an exceptional record at the Etihad Stadium, somehow. But it's not the best start to Manchester derbies for Eric Ten Hag, is it? I mean, Manchester United were fairly embarrassing, but I think I want to give the, the full credit here to just how fucking good Manchester City were. Not only with the goals that they scored, but the quality of the goals in particular. I think my personal favourite has to be Erling Haaland's second goal. Simply because of the role Kevin De Bruyne played in it. I mean, what a ridiculous pass. Not only would most players not be able to, to make that pass, most players wouldn't be able to see that fucking pass as an option. He was always going to get in on the end of it. He is just superhuman. 13, I think it is, Premier League goals for him. And an incredible start to his Manchester City career. He is just a phenomenon. But Phil Foden as well got the score in underway. Then a brace from Haaland and another from Foden just before halftime. Haaland turning from goal scorer to provider for that fourth one. Left it at game over at half time. You never could have seen Manchester United possibly coming back from that and well, they didn't. Anthony pulls one back with a stunning strike that just kind of came out of nowhere, really, in a game where United had showed nothing up until that point in an attacking sense. And instead of geeing up the Manchester United team, you could argue it probably had the opposite effect in the sense that it actually lit a fire under Manchester City, who were kind of probably more than happy to try and see out the game, having been 4 0 up at half time. But Haaland and Foden had time to add another one each and complete their respective hat tricks. Manchester United actually ended up making the scoreline look far more respectable than, you know, the performance and the gulf between the two teams would suggest. Thanks to a brace from Anthony Martial, a player I'd forgotten actually existed. Fairly easy tap in to make it 6-2 uh, and then a fantastic penalty to make it 6-3 the final score. And it, even though it's 6-3 and it's still a hammer and I do think the scoreline actually still flatters Manchester United in a way. The gulf between these two sides is, is so incredibly vast at the minute and, uh, and it looked like things were genuinely on the up for Manchester United but that is a, a real uh, humbling defeat for them and for Manchester City responding to uh, Arsenal obviously who are continuing to set the pace at the top of the Premier League we'll get into them in a bit that was a truly truly phenomenal performance like nearly every goal that Manchester City scored I'm literally sitting there on my couch in my sitting room like Holy fuck. What a team. What a team. And what a two players. What a performance by them two players that are in the green box this week. Erling Haaland and Phil Foden. Absolutely unbelievable to win the derby for Manchester City. Speaking of derbies, there was another big derby happening in the Premier League this weekend. And it was the North London derby. I've already alluded to it. Arsenal versus Tottenham. And going into this one, uh, I, I was very sceptical of, of Arsenal in a way. Because, you know, the people have ar argued. And, you know, it's a valid enough argument that, yes, Arsenal have been excellent this this season, but most of their wins have been against sides that realistically 
they should be beating. And you know, I think that in itself deserves credit because, you know, Arsenal over the last couple of years haven't always won the games that they're supposed to win. But obviously they fell at the hands of Manchester United, not with a terribly bad performance or anything like that, but they were unable to get the three points that day. And I was really intrigued to see how they would approach this game against Tottenham, who have been impressive at times this season, but I'm still not overly sold on. And it really did sell for me that Arsenal are so far clear when it comes to North London. A massive 3-1 victory. But the yellow box this week actually goes for a moment from Emerson Royale that was just completely out of the blue and just you're thinking, why has he done that? Why has he done that? Arsenal led through a stunner from Thomas Partey and then uh, Harry Kane scores a penalty because I feel like he nearly always manages to do that in the North London Derby after a ridiculous challenge by Gabriel on Richarlison. Gabriel Jesus snatched his fifth Premier League goal of the season marking a, an unbelievable start to his Arsenal career to make it 2-1 to Arsenal and it was thoroughly dominant for the whole game. I say Tottenham equalised but I have to stress that Arsenal were still by far the better side in this game even when it looked like Tottenham may be getting back into it. It was at this point then that Emerson Royale, I mean, Tottenham never really looked threatening anyway, but he really did diminish any sort of chance that Tottenham had of getting back into this game when he was shown a straight red for his challenge on Gabriel Martinelli. And I don't think there's any doubt in anyone's mind, this was a straight red. I think if he follows through with any more force than he did, we could have been looking at a horrific injury for, for Gabriel Martinelli, and luckily that didn't happen. But from that point on, Arsenal completely bossed things. They were bossing it anyway, and managed to get a third goal to, to symbolise that dominance in the game and it was Granit Xhaka who scored it he's having a bit of a, a renaissance for Arsenal kind of playing in a bit more of an advanced role this season Tottenham completely stretched at the back and uh, I think Conte it's a bit of a wake up call for him I do think he, he'll be looking at it, thinking maybe we have to change one or two things when we're going into these big games they went to, to Stamford Bridge and kind of played the same way and still managed to get a draw out of that game and I'm sure he was thinking Arsenal top of the league one of the best teams, if not the best team in the league so far this season. And, um, you know, we have to go there and try and hold what we have for a lot of the game. And it was just overly negative. And they were just picked apart by some beautiful Arsenal football, I have to say. I think you still have to raise questions about Arsenal. I don't think they're going to be in any sort of title race this season. I know that probably might piss off a few people in a sense because look how good they're doing. And I have to give them credit. Arsenal have been phenomenal this season. But I do think when they come up against particularly this Man City team uh, in a few weeks' time, I do think it could be a humbling for them. I don't think they're going to get hammered or anything like that. But I do think Man City's dominance will show through when the sides do meet. But... Credit where it's due, they showed up in this big game, big game and they were absolutely excellent. But a, a bit of a rush of blood to the head from Emerson Royale. And I think the weirdest thing about Emerson Royale, I'm hearing that he actually spent over a million pounds to try and improve himself in as a footballer at Tottenham. Um, that that is, is That's quite phenomenal, if you ask me. I really don't think he's up to code at all. I mean, I don't think Matt Doherty is anything special, particularly after watching him during the international break there. But my God, he surely has got to do a better job now in the next couple of weeks than Emerson Royale, if he's chosen. If it's not Jed Spence, who we're still yet to really see in a Tottenham jersey. But what a win for Aaron. So they keep their spot at the top of the Premier League, but Emerson, God, I'm sure Tottenham fans will be happy to not see him for the next three games. Stinker of the week, then, I'm going to give to VAR again. Um, and it's not like a couple of weeks ago where VAR there was like five or six absolutely horrific decisions all in the one weekend. But it's one that, in one game in particular, that left me thinking... Huh? Now don't get me wrong, I'm delighted to see that Chelsea have got off to a winning start under Graham Potter, a fairly underwhelming performance and I would say lucky to get the three points away at Crystal Palace. But three points is three points, what a goal by Conor Gallagher to win it. Uh, Aubameyang equalised after a brilliant goal by Hudson, Edward had given Palace the lead. Um, delighted with the three points, not so much with the performance. But there's this one incident in the game that leaves you scratching your head and it's when Palace are already 1-0 up in the game. Thiago Silva... How how has he not been sent off for this? I I do not know. Obviously not complaining from a Chelsea standpoint, but VAR looks at it. He clearly deliberately handballs it to deny. I think it was Odson Edward. It might have been Wilfred Zaha. I can't quite remember. Number one, what's he doing? I mean, it's not really in a huge area of of threat. If Edward gets the ball there, I mean, he could probably run in and create a chance. But like he's he's clearly deliberately slapped the ball while on the ground and. Uh, VAR is gone. Do you know what? That's fucking... That's all right. That is okay. Now, look, Chelsea have had their fair few decisions that, you know, they've been absolutely stiffed over this season at times. We've already talked about the Tottenham game. I still have Anthony Taylor up on my dart board. But this is just bizarre. And it gets even worse from, from a Palace standpoint, if you're a Palace fan looking in that, you know. Thiago Silva went on to assist the Aubameyang equaliser. A brilliant header down and a brilliant turn on the finish from Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. But seriously, uh, look, VAR, it can be used right, but used in the right hands. 
Like, how many times do I have to say this? I'm delighted Thiago Silva stayed on the pitch because uh, without him, I think it could have been a, a humiliating day at Selhurst Park. I mean, we weren't exactly up and at it at that point. We were already 1-0 down and not looking very encouraging at all. But if Thiago Silva gets sent off there, which would have been the right decision, it could have been very, very bad. And uh, a stinky, stinky VAR decision. One of the worst I've seen in, in a long, long time, I have to say. <laughs> all right, lads, that's where we're going to wrap it up. Uh, let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below on the boxes, but you've changed anything. Let me know your thoughts on the title race. Is there going to be a title race? Is it going to be between Man City and Arsenal? Is it going to go all the way like Liverpool in previous years? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section down below. Leave a like if you enjoyed, lads. Subscribe if you are new, and I will catch you later.